Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Out of the Fog. Well, tonight we bring you an hour-long special focused on the wildfires in Fort McMurray, Alberta, where approximately 15,000 Newfoundlanders and Labradorians call home. Now, for many, it's been a week of the unthinkable, as over 80,000 have fled their homes due to the raging wildfire. Now, this is a wildfire that is often referred to as a beast. Now, we've seen countless pictures and videos haunting images of what people have experienced as they were trying to get away uh, from under the grasp of this uh, wildfire uh, that's been ravaging their community. Now, this is a fire that has completely wiped out some neighborhoods like Beacon Hill and heavily damaged homes in Abbasand. It's reported that in all about 2,400 homes and buildings have burned, but now light at the end of a long, dark tunnel as 85 to 90 percent of Fort McMurray was spared. Many officials now say that Fort McMurray is still alive. Tonight, we're going to bring you personal stories of those affected, a description of what it's like battling a fire of this nature and size from the St. John's Regional Fire Department's Deputy Fire Chief and the support for Fort McMurray widens here at home in Newfoundland and Labrador. But first, we speak with Courtney Terrio, who's reporting from Lac La Biche, Alberta. Now, he is the host of Dinner Television Edmonton. Thanks very much for joining us, Courtney. My pleasure. So just give me a sense uh, of what the overall feeling that you're getting today. It's uh, one of uh, cautious optimism, uh, which uh, might seem a little startling to, to those uh, in other parts of the country who've seen the, uh, the devastation, the images, the haunting photos and videos coming out of Fort McMurray. But uh, the one thing that seems to be permeating throughout all the discussions we've been having with individuals here in Lac La Biche at the evacuation center uh, is that uh, they're a resilient bunch, that uh, you know they are trained to deal with situations like this. And that the amazing thing, the thing that really sticks out for them is how no one perished in the fire. That uh, despite the fact that they, they had to evacuate 88,000 people in just a matter of hours, uh, that there were no injuries, no lives lost. Uh, they all tell me at this point that uh, even those who, who've lost their homes, that uh, they're just glad that that is the case, and uh, that if they do go back, that they're going to build a bigger and better Fort McMurray. So certainly some positive news coming from such a devastation uh, that's taken place during these wildfires. Uh, I want to take uh, or talk about the tour that took place. Of course, Premier, Premier Nolte uh, took uh, part in this as well as the fire chief. Um, they really gave people a sense of the devastation. Can you paint us a picture of what that really looked like? Fort McMurray at this point is, is kind of a tale of two cities. Uh, a couple of neighborhoods, uh, unfortunately, bearing the brunt of the devastation that you speak of. Uh, we had a chance uh, to get a first-hand look uh, of what is still remaining in the communities of Beacon Hill and Abbasand. And uh, it is essentially uh, utter devastation. Uh, communities entirely leveled, uh, nothing but uh, uh, ashen gray and black everywhere you look. Uh, basements uh, basically look like uh, smoldering craters at this point uh, and strangely enough uh, in some instances uh, that what really startled us was certain things still standing in those communities in Beacon Hill uh, which is uh, essentially completely wiped off the map right now the school the school is somehow still standing in that community uh, which is a testament to the efforts of firefighters and obviously uh, good fortune. Now, uh, on the other side of that coin, as we mentioned, uh, 2,400 homes lost, but 25,000 saved. And a large part of that is the critical infrastructure that uh, would be required in order to allow people back into the community. We're talking about the water plant, the hospital, even City Hall still standing at this point, and uh, getting back to the notion of schools, miraculously, not one school in the entire city succumbed to the flames. And during that tour, uh, what was the message that uh, Premier Notley was giving to the people, the residents of Fort McMurray? 
again, the watchword this entire time seems to be uh, resiliency and that uh, despite the fact that the community has been hit so hard, uh, that the government is there. The phrase she keeps reiterating uh, almost daily is, we have got your backs. And uh, that is why uh, they have committed $100 million in relief funding directly to help the individuals who've been displaced. Uh, how they've also promised uh, that the funding will be there uh, to, to, to basically ensure that what needs to be rebuilt uh, will be rebuilt. Uh, the other side of that, though, is there urging people and we've seen uh, a handful of people making their way up to the roadblock on highway 663 or 63 rather at 881 uh, people trying to get back in aware that the fire has been tamed inside the city uh, but they're being told to stay away at this point it's still two weeks at least before we're going to be able to see uh, a re-entry plan let alone the actual re-entry so essentially the two messages here are that Notley says the province has their back but also to give them time to work and make sure that it is a safe return to Fort McMurray. You have spoken with uh, many people throughout your time there. Uh, what are people, I know that you talked at the start about what people are feeling, but what, are, what have they been saying to you in terms of, you know, what has happened over the last week? And, you know, obviously there is some hope and you talk about that resiliency uh, within the people. Do, do you think that they do feel that sense of optimism and hope at the end of the day? Yes, I mean, you look around here at uh, the Gold Center in Lac La Biche, and it's a sea of smiles as far uh, as the eye can see. There's no doubt that uh, everybody here is exhausted, and uh, everybody is certainly weighed down by the uncertainty of the situation. Uh, but, you know, even on Mother's Day, when we had a chance to, to talk to moms here, uh, the firefighters uh, brought in flowers for each and every one of those families. And we talked to one mom uh, who lost her home in the community of Supre Creek, but uh, she had her little daughter here. And uh, I think that was the key for her. She broke down into tears and she told us, you know what, I, I can replace the home. We can go back and we can rebuild that home. But what matters to me right now is that I've got my little one to hug and that uh, other people have their moms to hug. And and uh, that, I think, is, is it, that, uh, you know, the human toll on this uh, isn't quite as bad as uh, I think a lot of people anticipated it might be emotionally. We've heard so many stories, as you mentioned, uh, from people, and uh, even speaking in terms of our province here in Newfoundland and Labrador, there are 15,000 uh, approximately Newfoundlanders and Labradorians who are living in Fort Mac and now call Fort McMurray home. Um, in terms of the support, there's so much support. And if you can speak to me a little bit about that, I mean, I know what people are doing here in our province just to support those in Fort McMurray. What have you seen throughout your days there? It's been absolutely outstanding, the amount of generosity and, and humanity and compassion we've seen up here in northern Alberta. Uh, if you take a look at the, the center behind me here, uh, they actually had to turn away donations on the first day because uh, they'd already received such an influx uh, that uh, they just simply didn't have any place to put it. Uh, we know that uh, services uh, are being offered, everything that is conceivably needed uh, from, from daycare components to uh, health services, mental health services for those who've uh, been hit by the anguish of the situation. Uh, the insurance companies have been here, and I'll tell you what, this is, might be the very first time I've ever heard uh, so many people say positive things about insurance companies. Uh, and I certainly would be remiss if I didn't touch on uh, what we've seen on Highway 63. Uh, as we know, so many people were stranded on the uh, route on the way down. Uh, they were parched, there was no fuel, uh, supplies were limited. Uh, it was only a matter of hours before people were coming in from across the province. And uh, I can speak to uh, our situation, uh, people coming up that highway with water, with tanks filled with fuel to ensure that people got to where they needed to. We were up there just a couple of nights ago and uh, we didn't think we were going to be able to make it back to the nearest fueling spot. A uh, gentleman pulled over with his truck, filled up our vehicle to make sure we could get back to safety. Even better, and I think the thing that really kind of encapsulates the generosity up here is that he turned around to a vehicle that had been abandoned on the side of the road just a few meters north of us and filled up the tank. And we asked him why. His answer was, well, I want to make sure that when the owner comes back for it, it's ready to go. Amazing stories, Courtney. I want to thank you very much for taking the time and speaking with us this evening. My absolute pleasure, Aaron.
Well, we are going to take a very short break. Stay with us. We are going to hear one of those personal heartwarming stories. This one of Wayne Churchill, who had lost his home in the fire. Stay with us. Well, like so many Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, Wayne Churchill has been growing and raising his family in Fort McMurray. Now, he is one of the thousands of families uh, who had to flee and evacuate their home because of the wildfires. And Wayne joins me now by phone. Hi, Wayne. Hi, Erin. Hi, thanks so much for joining me. I know this is a you know a difficult time for, for you and your family at this time. Um, just tell me, how would you how would you describe what the last week has been like. Can you, can you put that into words? I can put it in a word, hectic. Mm -hmm. it's, it's been very hectic, uh, a lot to deal with, a lot to take in. Right. Um, how much time uh, did your family have to uh, evacuate your home? Um, Aaron, we had next to no time. Um, I was actually in school at the time, uh, which luckily was in the town of Fort McMurray, not out on site. Um, we didn't actually get an evacuation notice. Uh, we looked out the window and saw that uh, the smoke had really, really picked up. Uh, so our class decided that we best get to our homes. Uh, on my way home, there was, a, there was no call for an evacuation yet at that point. They were just advising people to prepare in case that did come. And uh, so by the time I got home from the time we were in the truck and left, it was a matter of 20 minutes, and even then there was already flames uh, ripping through the city. So you so were really, uh, really snuck up on people. Right. So you were saying before we started recording that you were kind of watching this unfold, even you know a few days before it really, I guess, kind of got out of control. Uh, yes, uh, my house faced west, uh, the direction that the fire was burning in. So uh, I didn't know what it was the first day. I just saw some smoke and proceeded by the second day, and it was a lot thicker and the third day and, and then by the fourth day it was it was in town by the fourth day right. so it's you your wife and you have two very small um, children I guess at the time and you say you know you only have 20 minutes to really grab what you can and, and leave um, so what was that moment like for you and your family uh, we were in a dizzy uh, we had one focus and that was to get what we needed for the children and uh, and to get our pets um, really, that was about it. Uh, once we grabbed everything we could for them, uh, we just focused on a couple other things, uh, hard drives, uh, the stored all of our baby pictures, stuff that can't be replaced. Uh, so we did manage to get those, thank heavens. You um, have so yeah, we were just literally running and tripping over each other, basically, in a, in a panic, trying to get everything we needed. Uh, so we stuffed a truck full with as much as we could and, and got out of there as soon as possible. Um, you have a, a trailer, uh, so that's what you're living out of right now at the moment? Yes, yes. So you were able uh, to, uh, that was next to your house, so you were, were able to just take all of your supplies and, and I guess stock that as fast as you can and hit the road? Uh, no, uh, I had my camper stored uh, about two hours south of Fort McMurray uh, oh, wow. in a town called Wandering River. Um, which, you know, was a godsend in itself. Um, so as we were leaving, we were trying to figure out, okay, well, we have to get out of our house. There's a fire approaching, but where are we going? Because we were told by the radios to evacuate to some evacuation centers within Fort McMurray. But um, based on the smoke and the flames we saw, we decided to get out of town. So we made a, a straight line straight to our camper and, um, and hooked on and towed it out. We've heard um, so many of the stories and seen, you know, video and, and pictures of people driving uh, along the highway and the, and the bottlenecks and, of course, um, you know, flames on the side of, of the highway. Uh, what was it like for you uh, traveling through with your family? That was the craziest part. Um, as soon as I pulled out of my driveway with the family and uh, what we could take for belongings, um, I made it uh, two houses up on my street and I was in gridlock traffic because there was one, there's one road leading out of my community. And, uh, you know, thousands of homes were all trying to evacuate simultaneously through that one road. Uh, so what I ended up doing was uh, 
after sitting there and not moving for about 20 minutes, I looked at the wife and said, uh, asked her if she knew if the access road, it's a basically a walking trail was open. And uh, so I put it in reverse, slammed the, slammed the fuel down and went in the opposite direction. And luckily that service road was open. So we jumped into a line of traffic going down through this walking trail down the hill. Um, once we got to the bottom, we had to, we had to bomb through some ditches. Uh, we got to the, the main highway, which was also gridlocked and not moving. So I bombed through another ditch and we actually fled town in the oncoming lane. Uh, it was just, it was just a nightmare, it really was. When you say nightmare, I mean, we've heard people describe it as, as a nightmare, as, you know, driving through Armageddon. Um, was there a, any point uh, in time? I mean, obviously that was a very scary situation, but did you ever think that, you know, you weren't going to make it out? There was, was a few moments. Um, like I said, we were in the, we were in the northbound lane, even though we were heading south, um, so we had a, a pretty much an open road, but uh, even still there was points where there was zero visibility. Um, all you could kind of see was the glow of flames through the smoke. Um, I was right on the bumper of the truck in front of me and it got to the point that I could barely see him. Mm -hmm. It was uh, it was nerve wracking. Uh, my wife was in the back trying to determine where the rest of her family is that also live in Fort Mac. Uh, they weren't able to make it out. Uh, they didn't have time because they had shut down the highway just after we made it through. So it was, it was a lot of turmoil. Uh, like I said, uh, my cat was in the cab. She's, she doesn't travel well. She was meowing, meowing, meowing. Mm -hmm. It was just, it was just chaos. My wife was crying, trying to determine where her family was. It was a uh, very traumatic to say the least. Right. Um, so Wayne, do you know the status of your house right now? I know that I was looking on your Facebook page and, uh, you know, I saw that you were trying to, trying to track and there were some pictures that you posted and, uh, I guess really trying to see what remains of your house, if anything, at this moment. Uh, yeah, I've, over the course of the last few days, uh, some better images keep coming through and, uh, yeah, unfortunately I have an aerial view of my home. Well, what's left of my home is just ashes, really. So you My know, whole neighborhood got destroyed. The entire neighborhood is, is all gone? Yes, the entire neighborhood on the, on the south side of Abbasand. I'm really sorry, uh, really sorry to hear that. Um, you know, I want to kind of switch to a little bit of positivity out of all this is that, you know, I know that there's been a lot of support. Um, before we started recording, you were talking about how people were driving along the side of the road just to offer any sort of assistance. Uh, so have you felt that uh, yourself in terms of the support that people are trying to give? Oh, absolutely. There, there's, I think there's more support being offered than that people are even able to receive. Uh, I think a lot of us that, that fled are kind of still in that surreal state where we, we don't really even know what we need yet. We're still trying to let it all absorb. But uh, yeah, like you mentioned, leaving town, going down the highway, uh, there was people with cherry cans of fuel, bottles of water, diapers, formula. They're everywhere. There's centers set up from Fort McMurray all the way to Calgary that are offering the same supplies. It's just come in, take what you need and carry on and, and try to rebuild your life. Yeah. So yeah. it's been, people have been amazing, not just, not just in Alberta, all across Canada. I mean, it's, it's been wonderful. In terms of trying to rebuild your life, um, you know, I know that obviously there's, uh, you know, lots of questions still remain. And do you know what the future holds for you and your family in terms of going back to Fort McMurray or what, what you may do? Um, we're still trying to figure that out exactly. Um, I know my, my place of employment, uh, Suncor Energy, they, as soon as possible, want to get up and running again. Mm -hmm. um, where I don't have a home to go back to, I, I don't know what's going to happen in that situation. Right. I'm kind of a little scared to go back, honestly. It's, uh, it's going to be really hard to, to drive through town and, uh, and see all that, all that destruction especially when we get to our neighborhood to see that we don't have a neighborhood anymore. It's, it's going to be tough. 
Well, Wayne, I want to thank you very much for joining me. And uh, I know obviously lots of devastation and a hard time, as you said, right now for you and your family and, um, and friends. And uh, I want to wish you all the best. And uh, thanks very much for joining me over the phone. Okay, no problem. Thank you, Aaron. Well, although a lot of people from this province call Fort McMurray home, there are a lot of people who fly in and out solely for work, like my next guest, Jason Drover, who joins me now in studio. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for making time to come in and speak with me. Oh, you're me. quite welcome. So you were just recently home. You're back home now uh, with your family in Conception Bay South. Um, so what are, you, what are you feeling right now? Um, well, I'm feeling more... Um, at peace now that I'm home with my family. Um, it's um, trying to catch up on uh, rest because you don't get much sleep when there's a lot of things going on. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was good to get home. It was a long venture, but you know, I, I managed to get home. Right, so it's nice to see that you are here and safe and sound, of course, and I know obviously your family is uh, very thankful to have you back. Yes, very yeah. much so. Um, my, uh, my wife and my daughter and my parents, they met me at the airport on Saturday, and uh, it was quite an emotional experience, to say the least. I had also I'd been gone away for four months, so that made it that much more um, when it comes to the excitement of getting home, but it wasn't about the excitement anymore, it was about uh, being with them mm -hmm. and being away from, well, the obvious. <laughs> right, the so, fires, the wildfires. Yeah. Um, so let's just backtrack a little bit because you had been away for four months. You were working and, uh, I guess, living in the camps. Um, when all of this happened, you had a lot of people who were fleeing Fort McMurray uh, that came over to, uh, to your camp. Yes. Uh, when I, uh, I was working night shift and I... Um, I had gotten up to get ready for work and I received a call from my day shift counterpart and he had told me that I wouldn't be coming in and I asked him why and he said, well, Fort McMurray is on fire. And when you hear a statement like that, you sort of, it's, you, you chuckle in a way because it just sounds so unreal because you say, oh yeah, all right, what on, whatever. But the, um, we had had an evac in the town the day before and it was, the fire was controlled, so we said, oh, well, whatever. So anyway, I left and went downstairs in the camp, and when I showed up in the lobby, that's when all the vehicles were pulling in. <laughs> and there was literally thousands and thousands of men, women, children, every kind of animal you can think of, dogs, cats, rabbits, hamsters, lizards, you, you name it, and everything, everyone just grabbed whatever they could. And, um, it was... Would you say just chaos at that, at that no, moment? No, or? that was the thing. You see, everything seemed to be very calm. That's what surprised me the most, was how calm people were. Mm -hmm. And just wanting a place to bring their kids. And um, myself and my coworkers, we tried to see um, if there was anyone there that we knew and that we could help out. And, uh, it was one incident of one incident that ha incident that happened while we were there, when all this was going on, because we were all still trying to grasp this in our heads, because we were all on our phones and checking out the news, and you're getting all this information. And <clears throat> uh, my general foreman, the gentleman I work for, uh, he was standing there talking. We're outside, and this truck pulls up, and when the door opens, all I hear is this little girl's voice, "Papa." This is his granddaughter, his daughter and his granddaughter. Now, he stays in the camp because he lives in Cape Breton, and he works there. But his daughter and family live in Fort Mac. Mm -hmm. And she came up and ran up in his arms. And when, he, when she jumped up there, he said, everything's okay, Papa's here. And he said, I got a room for you. He said, you're going in my room. And his daughter looked at him, and he said, how is everything? And she said, it's gone. And that was it. So they left and went in the camp. So uh, I was working with my uncle at the time. He works there with me. And we spoke about our rooms. We had these big executive rooms, because we were in supervision. We used to get these big rooms. And I'm going, why are we staying here? 
if we can get through the town and get home, get to his home, because he lives in south of Fort McMurray, why are we staying here? The families need the rooms. We don't need the rooms. And if worse come to worse, we'll stay in the truck. It doesn't matter. And, you know, these are families. My family is home and, you know, and they're fine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here are these families, they, they don't know if they have anything left anymore. So that must have touched you emotionally on a personal level, knowing that you have your own family at home, yes. but to see these families in, in shock and, and despair. Yeah, exactly, and it's, it was very hard emotionally, and it was hard to react to people because you have all different sorts of people, and some people can be very negative and very selfish, and I, and I don't like to emphasize on that, but they're there, and the comments get passed, and you really have to fight hard to not get involved with that because you, you come down to that level and I, there was a few moments I had to leave and go back to my room because I couldn't, I couldn't face these people because it was making me angry and I didn't, I didn't want to be. I was emotional at this point. I'm a very emotional person and I, I was at that breaking point of, um, uh, where, what can I do for these people? So you gave up your room and, and, and you hit the road essentially yes, to, to uh, try to get back yes. here. And as I, we spoke to a number of our coworkers that were still there, they said the first opportunity they get to go, they're giving up their rooms and they're going as well. And they did. Mm -hmm. I got to say, there was, I know a lot of these guys personally, and yes, their only, their major goal was to get back to their families, but Ultimately, they seen all these people, the important thing was that they had somewhere to, to go. When you reflect back on what has happened, and, and can you look towards the future at all? Like, what do you see for the future in Fort McMurray right now? The future in Fort McMurray, knowing the type of people, the way that society is there, and it is, it's its own unique society, I really have to say that. And you hear a lot of reports of this or different things, but I can honestly say, their resolve is unbelievable, unbelievable. If they can see it happen, they're gonna make it happen. And I really truly believe that they're going to come back from it and stronger, I really believe it. The type of people that are there, the local, what I call local residents, the Albertans that are from there, and the expatriate Newfoundlanders, Cape Bretoners, New Brunswick, Ontario, people from everywhere. Then you have your international communities that are there, which there are a lot of. Like I said, the resolve, unbelievable. They're not, they weren't concerned. I spoke to an operator there that worked up in the plants for years, 20 odd years. He's from Newfoundland, but he's been up there most of his life. And he said, my family's fine. I don't care about the rest of it. He said, we'll get all that, we'll, we'll take care of that. But he said, I'm not going anywhere. You know, he said, we built it years ago, we'll build it again. It doesn't matter. That stuff doesn't matter, it's only material. And it's amazing to hear them because they're just so positive to say, listen, you know, we're okay now. Let's get everything cleaned up up there so we can start back and do, go back to what we were doing. And that's, that's the attitude. Well, Jason, we have to leave it there, but I want to thank you so much for coming in and uh, sharing your experience with me and, and the stories of the people of Fort McMurray. Well, and uh, I'm glad you're here, home, safe and sound. So am family. I. <laughs> thank you. I got your back, big guy. Join us in our mission to help protect Bex at work. Help! Help! Somebody call 911. He's not breathing. Please, anybody. Does anybody know first aid? Son, I'm a paramedic. We need to know what you're allergic to. Ma'am! Ma'am! Can you tell me where you live? Sir, have you been taking heart medication? Do you have any allergies we should know about? Can you tell me who to call? If you're unconscious, you can't answer the simple questions that could save your life. Great, he's wearing medic alert. Noah, everything's gonna be okay. Medic alert.
speaks for you when you can't. More Newfoundlanders and Labradorians live in Fort McMurray than in practically every community in our own province. So the devastation caused by the ongoing wildfire came as a great shock to all of us. On behalf of the Newfoundland and Labrador NDP, I would like to extend best wishes to all families and individuals who were dislocated by this catastrophe, as well as our appreciation and congratulations to the firefighters and other first responders who did so much to contain the damage. Fort McMurray has contributed greatly to the economy of this province, and Newfoundlanders and Labradorians have contributed greatly to the economy of Fort McMurray. I'm confident that the legendary resilience of our people will help in the reconstruction of homes and neighborhoods that have been destroyed and in the rebuilding of the Fort McMurray economy. Well, this fire has been dubbed the beast and uh, joining me now to give us a sense as to what firefighters have been enduring during uh, these wildfires. We have uh, the St. John's Deputy Fire Chief Don Byrne joining me now in the studio. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks very much for joining me. Um, so I'm just wondering what, what has been your initial reaction when, when all of this started taking place out west? Overwhelming. Uh, when you see the size of the fire at the interface level, which uh, as we discussed previous there, the interface and urban is just where your property lines will meet the forest. And when you see the size of the forest fire, uh, the structural firefighters there, it, it had to be very overwhelming for them. This is obviously, uh, will essentially go down in history. I know that the fire chief out west talked about saying this, this fire will essentially be studied um, uh, in time. Um, I'm just wondering, is this, have you ever faced anything uh, of, of this size throughout your career? No, nothing of this uh, catastrophic size. Uh, you know, we can go back to uh, when we had the uh, Harvey Road fire. Uh, that was like a devastation zone when that was done. We had a fairly, we've had a couple of fairly significant forest fires in our region, uh, but nothing that would even come close. Mm -hmm. uh, again, this is very overwhelming for those individuals there, I'm certain, but from all accounts, uh, they have done a superb job to the point that they now say they've saved 85% of the structures that were in that interface area. Right. So when you talk about, uh, when you say 85% of those structures, uh, is, that, is that surprising, considering how fastly this has moved? Considering the size of, of this fire uh, and the, the sheer volume of fire as it approached the uh, neighborhoods mm -hmm. and certainly the downtown core, uh, they've, they've done extremely well. So tell me a little bit about, I guess, what firefighters do in terms of trying to combat this, because a lot of what you do is dealing with structural fires, but this was both dealing with structural fires and then there was a large component, of course, which was, um, you know, hitting forest and forestry. Well, basically, you have two components there uh, on location, I would suggest, and that is the forestry uh, personnel, uh, albeit with their helicopters and their water bombers, the structural firefighting in, they're there to protect the property of uh, the residences and the commercial end. And they're not geared the same as forest firefighters. Uh, they're wearing structural firefighting equipment, bunker gear, which becomes very fatiguing in that situation. So there's the downside of a structural firefighter trying to fight a forest fire. Now, Again, their role is primarily to protect the property mm -hmm. uh, and not to fight the forest fire as per se. When you're going in to try to protect a property, um, you know, I heard one interview with, with a fire chief out in Fort McMurray was uh, saying essentially they had to abandon one community because it, it was burning to the ground and they knew that realistically there was nothing that they could do for that one neighborhood and they decided to move on. How hard are those choices to make when you're in that moment? Those uh, choices are very hard, uh, but they have to be made because what you're getting down to is uh, what is savable, what is priority, uh, 
And those components, when you're making a decision, they're tough. I mean, we've seen situations, or I've seen situations just downtown where we've had to say, okay, we're not able to save this building here. So we're gonna move to the next and stop it there. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's essentially what they've done on a greater magnitude. Uh, I want to take a step back because you talked about, uh, you know, in terms of the, the suits and, and the gear that they're wearing and you do get fatigued. Um, I can only imagine how hard it is both, uh, I guess, physically on the body and both mentally when you're trying to essentially save your community. Um, so just tell me a little bit about that in terms of how much it really takes out of you when, when you're doing this job. Most structural firefighting will last upwards of if you have a fully involved building, will last upwards to two, two and a half hours as to before you move staff out of that zone and allow them to have some downtime. These guys up there, they're not getting any downtime. They, they've been inundated. I would suggest that their shifts are going in excess of 12 hours. So that's gotta be tough uh, physically and certainly mentally because uh, these guys there, they're not just protecting someone else's property, they're protecting their own. I'm sure they have a very great sense of community there. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's anything um, that I guess we can learn here in, in our province or in St. John's, uh, I guess moving forward when you look at what has taken place in Fort McMurray? Most definitely. Uh, when you look at wherever urban areas interface with forest, uh, what can we do to lessen the actual dynamics of a forest fire when they approach us. Well, if you're a budding forest, you need to make sure that you keep your own grounds cleaned up. Uh, a lot of people will pile different types of wood and so on at the back of their properties. It's not a good idea because that becomes a fuel source. So you wanna make sure you keep that cleaned up, even to the types of trees that we plant in and close to our residences. I mean, your spruce trees, uh, these and pine trees, these things are tinder boxes if they're close to your homes. There are different trees that wouldn't burn quite so readily. Uh, your alder type trees, your uh, birch, elm, maples. Those types of trees, they give you a safer uh, residence area. Now, if you look at it in terms of distances, well, for the first 30 feet, you'd you keep everything cut back as much as possible and then you go out further again. And again, do the pruning. If you really are interfaced closely with forest, well, walk through it and keep it trimmed up about six, seven feet in the underbrush, keep that cleaned up also. And that'll stop fire from spreading so readily. A lot of uh, a lot of takeaways and actually some work that I have to do yes. uh, just by listening to that when I go yes. home. So thank you very much for this and thanks oh, for coming very in and uh, giving us some insight. To, sure. Thank you. All right. Then. We are going to take a very short break, but we'll be right back. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. Over the weekend, Rogers TV partnered with Steel Communications to bring you six hours of live television. It was a radiothon slash telethon, all to raise money for Fort McMurray, and that money went to the Canadian Red Cross. Joining me now is Anna Power. She's the manager of fund development with the Canadian Red Cross here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Thanks so much for joining me. Oh, thank you for having me. So, uh, amazing day on Saturday. Uh, of course, everybody was set up at the Avalon Mall. Um, a lot of money raised in that short amount of time. Definitely. Uh, it was quite a day. It was quite a weekend since it's happened last week. We've had an outpouring of support from Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. That is always the case. We are such a generous community of people in Newfoundland and Labrador. Well, at the end of the day on Saturday, we announced that $250,000 was raised for the people mm -hmm. of Fort McMurray. It has since grown then, because uh, I know obviously you are still open for donations. What, what is the total amount? $308,000. To $308,222 to be exact. <laughs> uh, it was quite an outpouring of support. We did receive additional donations even after the phone lines closed, which was fantastic. 
Right. So where exactly is this money going? How will it help people uh, in Fort McMurray? Well, uh, from the minute that the uh, disaster happened and the evacuation happened, Red Cross was on the ground providing support directly to people who are impacted and people who are evacuated. Uh, so this is what I would call, I guess, the relief phase of our operation. Uh, it is when we provide the most urgent basic needs for people who are uh, evacuated from their home. And those needs are, we deal with on an individual basis, but generally speaking, it's anything from food or clothing, uh, helping them with the reception centers and shelters that they have open, uh, to providing formula for babies. Whatever the most urgent basic needs are, we deal with individuals and individual families, we do an assessment with them, and then we provide the needs based on what their individual needs are. When you think of the needs and, and the list of, of things that you just mentioned in terms mm -hmm. of what may be provided to people and families, um, how great is the need? Are you getting a sense of, um, you know, I guess, obviously you're in, you're in a relief phase now, mm -hmm. but this isn't going to end anytime soon, really, is it? No, it isn't. Uh, and, you know, until people get back into the community and be, are able to assess themselves, what the damage is to their own individual families, uh, to the structures and, and so forth, uh, that's when they'll have a better sense of what their needs needs are. Uh, but right now we're having people who have either come home to Newfoundland and Labrador for a short period of time to be with their family while they wait to go back to their home or some may be staying home for a longer period of time but right now they're reaching out to the Red Cross here in this province and we are providing them with support. So you don't necessarily have to be in Alberta. Wherever you are in Canada there is a Red Cross and we are there to provide support wherever the people need us. You've been asking people to register uh, mm -hmm. with the Canadian Red Cross. Why, why is that? What's the difference between being registered and not being registered? It's really important that people register and uh, for anyone who is at home listening to this show and knows of loved ones who are either coming home and have not registered or you know they're talking to them on, on the phone or on FaceTime or whatever, really encourage people to register with the Red Cross. It is how you get in our system and how we can provide you with support down the road. Um, 45,000 people have registered so far. So we know that people understand the importance of registering with us and uh, I really encourage people to take the time. The process is very quick. You go on to our website and all of the links will be there to register uh, as somebody impacted by the fires in Fort McMurray or in that Alberta area. You mentioned that it, you know, it doesn't matter really where you are, whether you've come back home here to Newfoundland and Labrador or whether you're still uh, in Alberta, uh, that, that you know, you're the help is there mm -hmm. for you uh, in, in, which, in whichever way that you may need it. Um, do you know approximately how many Newfoundlanders and Labradorians that, that you've heard from so far that have touched base? Honestly, I wouldn't want to throw a number out there because I'd be afraid that I wouldn't be giving the accurate number. And even as I left the office today, there were people coming in. And it wouldn't just be at our office here in St. John's, our office in Grand Falls, Windsor, and the office in Corner Brook would be receiving people as well. So uh, this is relatively new that people are starting to contact us in the last couple of days so I don't want to throw out numbers that are not even uh, up to date in so just I'd rather not give you numbers at this point okay no no worries at all uh, in terms of the information that you do want to give I know that obviously you're still looking for donations people can still donate um, and you know there are various means that they can do that but of course there's one spot that has all the information yes they can always go to www.redcross.ca there's a, an option for you to donate now online uh, we're getting a lot of uh, people going to our website to donate online people can always call a Red Cross office and uh, make donations they can come in to the Red Cross office and I'd be remiss Aaron if I didn't mention the community outpouring of support that continues even after the Radiothon this past weekend which was phenomenal right uh, but there's a number of uh, there's a Chinese restaurant City Lights Buffet as an example who on Monday they're typically not open on Monday and on Monday they're opening their doors and they're for, from 1130 I believe it is to 830 they're donating the proceeds of everything from the buffet to the Canadian Red Cross and that is one of many that are going on benefit concerts downtown in Clarenville in CBS it all you have to do is watch Facebook and you can see all of the activities that are happening people want to become engaged and they want to help people and uh, it's a phenomenal outpouring of support and I can assure you the Canadian Red Cross uh, is very accountable with the funds that are given to us and I can assure you that this is not something that we're going to do in the short term to help the people of Alberta we will be there for the long haul
Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. I want to thank you very much for coming in and uh, providing that information for our viewers. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are going to take a very short break, but we'll be right back. Still lots more to come here tonight on our special on Fort McMurray here on Out of the Fog on Rogers TV. You know what I like? Keeping back safe. Mine and my team's. And the best way to protect backs is to know how. Like when something's too heavy to be lifted by one person. Bring in the forklift! I can. I can. I can. I did. I took this picture of my wife when she was near death waiting for a liver transplant. And this is her now. Hello, I'm Lise Breckenridge. A liver transplant saved my life. What can I say? You be the judge. Your donation will help Canadians understand the importance of pledging to be an organ donor. And it will help save the lives of so many more. As it has for us. And welcome back. Well, one of the many headlines coming out of Fort McMurray is the immense amount of support that has been given to those who've had to flee their homes. And uh, that support is going strong here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Joining me now is Tracy Robbins and Dana Medcalf Evans, who have started Out of the Ashes, uh, an amazing uh, group. And uh, they're here to tell us all about that. So thanks very much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. So Tracy, just tell me, I guess, where did, the, where did all of this start? Because it, it, it happened quite quickly very quickly um, I guess I whenever something happens I think okay how can I help and knowing that so many Newfoundlanders were coming back I thought there must be a Facebook page out there to help these people and so I went looking and I didn't find one so I thought I will create one and which I did and I uh, the idea was for people to be able to connect so if there was somebody in need and somebody that had something to provide they could connect on this page uh, within, I guess, probably definitely within 24 hours, if not a couple of hours, uh, there were more specific families coming through and other people that were helping them out. And there were call outs on Facebook can we get this? Can we get that? And then I met Dana that way. And then the ball just started rolling. And here we are with, I think, almost 2,000 fans on that page and so many shares every hour of all of the information we're providing and uh, loads and loads and loads of donations. Okay, we'll get to what uh, you're looking for in terms of donations. Uh, Dana, I wanna bring you into the conversation. So out of the ashes, once you saw this page, this is something that you kind of really jumped on in terms of trying to help people who are coming back home with really, uh, you know, nothing in their suitcases. Absolutely. Um, I had been approached by a few of our local in St. Philip's, local families that have been coming home I'm of course very active in the community and I was like how do we handle like we did a fire in St. Phillips not too long ago and when we put an outcry we ended up with like our whole entire lawn the ditch the driveway my backyard we ended up having to transport trucks loads of stuff to the women's shelter and with such so much people wanting to help how were, how would we how could you handle it so I went looking for a Facebook page or to create a Facebook page to, to work on potentially doing a center somewhere where we could centralize and, and work in numbers and that's where I met Tracy. So what exactly, I know that uh, you know there's obviously lots of clothes you were talking about before we started recording, uh, what are you looking for in, in way of donations? Well we have a lot of clothes which is awesome um, but now I think we're at the point where we could use uh, diapers and formula and wipes and that kind of thing, even gas cards, grocery cards, because they don't take up some, as much space as the clothes, which we're still very grateful for, but it, it's accumulated pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So you have, uh, this is, you have a home base right now, but you do have an event that's taking place on Saturday. You wanna tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yes, I mean, with, with things of this nature, of course, you're, the initial trauma to the families, once that wear off and they get on their planes and they come home, 
it becomes very spaced in between and we are depending on a community to use their facilities and their resources where they have ongoing fundraisers and charities it gives you a limited amount of time for setup so we have um, until Sunday at the Anglican Church in St. Phillips and what we plan to do now to facilitate being able to support in a big bang so to speak in going out is we are facilitating a garage sale of any un unused items to sell off and donate the proceeds to the Red Cross. Any diapers, um, food, underwear, personal effect items, we will distribute to the women's and the men's shelter. Okay, so uh, lots of stuff happening, especially throughout this week. I know you both are, are working. Uh, you have your own careers and stuff throughout, and families, of course. Uh, if anybody wants to make a donation, what's the best way? How can they get in touch? They can either drop by the Anglican Church in St. Phillips. They can message us on our Facebook page, Out of the Ashes. They can phone. We have phone. a call me now button. We have a call me button on the Facebook page. Um, so, but we, I think we really need to connect with the Fort McMurray evacuees that are coming here to tell them that we have these things and we would love for them to come and take them. Right, so tell me about, uh, I guess, who you've heard from so far in terms of families and, and who you've connected with? We had a, <clears throat> well, we, we had the onset of families initially, which were friends of friends and friends of friends. And um, we did receive many thank you messages in our inbox from families that have been grateful for our support. We received one in particular at four o'clock this morning. A young man had messaged us right off the airplane. He was actually in the airport. He's like, we just got here. I have a six month old baby. Myself and my wife and my child have nothing. And they did have some provisions that were given to them before they left Edmonton, but they had limited amount of luggage. Like they were limited to one bag apparently, like they had changed some policies um, for facilitating transporting people. So um, they were like, we just need some help. We just need a little bit of help to get us through till we can get back around the bay actually. I think they live out of town mm -hmm. and they said once we get there we'll regroup and figure it out. Okay well obviously there is definitely a need and there will still continue to be a need as you see people coming home here to Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, what you're doing is amazing. I want to thank you very much and uh, again just a quick uh, recap I guess of how people can get in touch. They can find us on Facebook. Uh, out of the Ashes is the group name and there is you can message from there, you can call from there or drop by the facility. We're there from 10 o'clock to 8 o'clock in the evening, and that's Cody's Road. 18 Cody's Road. 18 Cody's Road in St. Phillips at the Anglican Church. Okay, we have to leave it there. I want to thank you very much for joining me. Thank, thank you. you. There are many ways in which people have shown their support for Fort McMurray by providing gas, shelter, clothing, but others have shown support through song. Up next, we bring you a song that was specifically written and recorded for the people of Fort McMurray. Mike Braniff was touched by the words of Fort McMurray's fire chief when he said, we are here, we are strong, and wrote that those words made this song easy to write. Here's We Are the Mac. We are here, we are strong. We are here, we are strong. We are the Mac, it won't take long. Till we get home, we will be back. For we are here, we are the Mac. Sing it loud. Strong. We are the Mac. This is our song. When we get home and build it back, we will be here. We are the Mac. We are here. We are strong. We are the Mac. It won't take long.
Well, that is it for our show tonight. I want to thank you very much for joining us for our hour-long Fort McMurray special here on Out of the Fog. Now, you can continue to donate by going to the Red Cross website. Also, for families returning to this province, the Red Cross is asking that you register on their website to receive uh, support. And as we say goodnight, we're going to leave you with some pictures from the Steel Communications Radiothon slash Telethon that took place over the weekend, where over $300,000 was raised, and that number continues to grow with your support. Hope you have a wonderful evening, everyone. And of course, we will do this all again very soon. Same time, same place right here on Out of the Fog on Rogers TV.